scripture reading this morning is coming from Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And this won't be on the screen, but Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Have you ever asked, or maybe you had someone maybe accuse you of this, have you ever been told you are narrow-minded? I'm not talking about going to the same restaurant every Sunday and order, ordering the same meal every every time. If you're okay with ordering a plain hamburger with only fries every time, that's up to you. That's not really what we're talking about when we talk about being narrow-minded. And so when we think about this idea and this question of, are you narrow-minded? And that's the question we're going to answer this morning. And I, I do believe, and I think as we go through this, you'll understand what I mean, that it's not wrong to be narrow-minded on certain things. If your favorite sports team is the same over the years, regardless of their record, uh, some might call that narrow-minded, but that's not what we're talking about either. We're talking about being spiritually narrow-minded. And so let's define our term here as we think about narrow-minded. And the definition I want to use here and the one I've seen is having restricted or rigid views and being unreceptive to new ideas. Now, there are certain times in life where that would be very dangerous, wouldn't it? If you work in a factory and they say, we have a new machine that's going to be able to do this a little bit easier for you, safer for you, it's a little bit different, you have to learn how to use it. And if you were to say, no, I'm not doing it. I've always done it this way. I'm not going to change. What would happen? You'd be shown the door. But spiritually speaking, are we not to be narrow-minded? Are we not to follow the narrow path that we find in the, in the pattern that we find in the New Testament for how we live, for how we worship God, for the way of salvation? You know, the ways of man have changed numerous times over the years, but the Word of God still stays the same, doesn't it? It's not because it's an ancient book that no one adds to. It's because it's the Word of God that needs no one to add anything to it. It doesn't need help from us. It doesn't need a new edition or a new up, updated version or anything of that nature. God's Word in its truest form just needs us to apply it to our own lives each and every day. So let's begin by looking at God's area of acceptance is narrow. God's area of acceptance is narrow. What we mean by that is his area of acceptance, that is th those who, we, who he will accept or those who he finds pleasing in his sight, it's a narrow field, isn't it? If you look at John chapter 3, Verses 16 and 17. And we know that probably even the, the, the drunk on the street probably can tell you verse 16. But we want to include a, a verse 17 because that's not always included with this. But in John 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That tells us why he did what he did. Because God loves mankind. That is not to be confused with God condoning the way that mankind lives. That's not what that verse is saying. You can love people without agreeing with everything that they do, right? We are told throughout the Bible to love the souls of men. But we do not always love the actions or the lifestyles of men. We find in verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son we see that what he his feelings towards towards the world towards mankind and the results of it he gave his only begotten son that is his unique one-of-a-kind son he says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life whoever puts their obedient faith in him in christ should not perish but have everlasting life we believe and accept that christ is the son of god which moves us to that full obedience of the gospel looking at verse 17 <laughs> for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world 
but that the world through him might be saved. You know, God doesn't have to send his son in the world to condemn the world. Because of sin, the world is already condemned. God has came to seek, or rather Christ has came to seek and save that which was lost. If the world wants to be condemned, all God has to do is step back and watch. Because sin has already done that job, made it possible for mankind to be condemned. God has made it possible for us through his son to avoid that condemnation to have heaven as our home through obedience to his word. And we find in verse 17, he tells us, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't need to do that. But that the world through him might be saved. If he wanted mankind to be saved, he was going to have to send his son. And he did that. And he tells us why again in verse 16. Because God so loved the world. Now we may ask, what is the narrow field of acceptance? Why is, where does that come into play in verse 16 and 17? Because you have to believe and obey God, don't you? You have to accept Christ as the Son of God and as part of God's plan for man's salvation. God desires for no one to perish. Thus we find in verse 17, He has sent His only begotten Son, right? Now, how is the lost made acceptable to God? You know those same verses still apply. We believe that obedient belief in Christ as the Son of God. We put on Christ in baptism, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And we are able to have heaven as our home so long as we are faithful to God. That through him we, the world might be saved, verse 17, right? Man is only saved when he obeys God's gift is no doubt beyond words. How can you put into words the greatest love that mankind has ever known? How can you possibly put that into words? There's only one word that I think of, and it's the Greek term for the word love, agape. It's a type of love. It's a sacrificial love. And that's the kind of love that God has for mankind, that sacrificial love. He's willing to make sacrifices, and he has, over and over again, for the sake of you and I. God's gift is beyond words, but, it, but that doesn't change the fact that man must be obedient in order to take advantage of it, which leads us into our next point. The way of salvation and worship is narrow. The way of salvation and the way of worship is narrow. We find first, we want to notice a decree that is given in, in Mark chapter 16, in verses 15 and 16, he tells his disciples there, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. You know the silly part about verses 15 and 16? People disagree with it. What do we mean by that? They will tell us, when we look at verse 16, that he believes and is baptized will be saved, but he does not believe will, 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 will be condemned. That tells us, they say, that baptism isn't part of God's plan. Why do you need step three if you don't do step two? Right? Why do, you need, why do you need to mention baptism if they don't even believe? Why would you mention the very next step? And by the way, if you don't do this either, you still won't be saved. That'd be silly, wouldn't it? Why would you mention the next, step, the next step if the first one isn't met? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What is it that saves mankind? What is it mankind is to believe in and obey? It's there in verse 15, isn't it? The gospel. The gospel. You know, the gospel, when it's truly the gospel, is free from the ideas and the theories and the teachings and the traditions of man. The gospel doesn't contain tradition. It contains teachings of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the only thing that saves. That's the only thing they are to preach. To every creature, that is literally every single person here, there, and everywhere, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. The person who, what, who believes the gospel, the gospel includes a plan of salvation, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. 
But gospel tell you, tells you you need to hear, you need to believe, you need to repent, you need to confess, and yes, you need to be baptized. That's all included in the gospel. We know that from Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts is referred to many times as a book of conversion for a reason, or of conversions for a reason, because we find numerous acts of conversion, and we find what? We find the same things being done. And we find in verse 16, he says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That obedient belief, obeying the gospel, believing the gospel, obeying those things therein, and being baptized. That person, he says, will be saved. That is a narrow field of view, isn't it? But think about this for a second. We were talking about this yesterday in our, our apologetics class, my last class of the semester. And I talked about, one of the things I brought up was that apologetics has to lead you to somewhere. Apologetics, because you're talking about the Bible, you're talking about God, you're talking about Christ, should cause us to want to respond based upon what we have learned. That response should be that we want to obey the gospel. You know that all the things that God requires a man to have salvation, they're nothing that no one is unable, they're all things that everyone is able to do, right? They're all steps which we all can do. You know, there are those today who would tell you, if you want to be saved, and this is another denomination, a denomination out there telling people this, if you want to be saved, there's one in Springfield that said this, and if you have to be able to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Is that possible? No. And it's very easy to understand why. The, who could pass on the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Only apostles. So when they passed on those gifts, those who received those gifts, when they passed away by logical timelines, what happens? It comes to an end. Not only is the Bible teach us it's going to come to an end, but by logical timeline, we see it's going to come to an end. So can we speak in tongues today? No. No one here is an apostle. No one here had, their, had an apostle lay their hands upon them, giving them that gift. So we can't do that. They have given men an impossible task in order to obtain salvation. Can we kneel at a so-called mourner's bench to pray? And then when we pray enough, whenever that time comes, we rise up and we are now saved. As yet another denomination, another man-made group tells people, how would you know when to get up? Friends, the Bible, while narrow in the minds of some, is simple to, to all of us. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. All part of the gospel which they were to preach in verse 15. And we find in verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he does not believe will, will be condemned. He who does not obey the gospel will not be saved. That's the crux of it in verse 16, isn't it? A narrow field, but God sets the terms, doesn't He? Only by being in Christ can we be saved. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 8. Matthew 22 and verse 8. We know this as the, uh, the, the, the parable of the wedding feast, right? Looking at verse 8, and we're not going to look at all this, but Matthew 22 verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Does not tell us everyone has a chance, has the ability to obey the gospel? It's one of the ways I think about it. Everybody can come and hear the gospel. Verse 10, So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. When could they enter into the, into the wedding hall? We're going to find a moment when they put on the right garment, right? When does the Christian put on Christ? Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27 tells us, As many were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ, verse 27, right? So we put on Christ, we put on that garment that places us in the body of Christ as being represented here, and we obey the gospel. So the good and bad must have been those, who, reference really to those who have made themselves, uh, have done what was necessary to enter the hall, the wedding feast, or wedding hall, and, they were filled, and the hall was filled with guests, verse 10. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there, he did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. What does that mean in verse 12? He didn't belong. Now, does anyone sneak into the Lord's church? No. But the point is clear, isn't it? If you don't have on the right garment, if you're not in the body of Christ, 
it's not possible to have heaven as your home, to be able to be in that wedding hall, right? He was speechless. Verse 13, what happened? He was taken out into outer darkness where there, be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many have a chance to hear and to obey, but few actually do it, right? What would happen if every time you, you had a Bible conversation, it resulted in a genuine conversion? We'd have to bring in more chairs, wouldn't we? We'd have to build a bigger building. But because many have a chance to hear and few are chosen, meaning few actually obey, that's not always the case, is it? People don't always obey. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, as I've been quoting already, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Our, some friends like to read verse 26 and stop there, but faith alone is not taught anywhere in the scriptures, no matter what verse you want to leave out. Verse 27 tells us, who is in Christ? Those who are baptized into Christ. It's not just faith, faith in verse 26, but as part of uh, God's plan for man's salvation, we have to have faith, that obedient faith, and we have to be baptized, washing away our sins, Acts 2, verse 37 and 38. And we put on Christ when we do that, not before. Look with me at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, as we think about this narrow field of salvation, right, this narrow view, look at Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? Now, first of all, verse, 20, verse 2, what is it they're being told they're transgressing? Tradition. Tradition. Have you ever transgressed the tradition of your family where you brought a side dish? Maybe maybe every year for the last 10 years, you always brought the exact same side dish and it was expected. In year 11, you said, you know what? I'm tired of making that. I really don't like it anymore. I want to make something else. And you come and some might say, well, where is it? Well, I kind of broke tradition today. You know, sometimes that works with a laugh and sometimes it doesn't work at all. But here in verse 2, what are they telling his disciples? That they're wrong. They actually have sinned by breaking a tradition of what? Of men, of elders. Who are elders? They're men. Tradition, not even a command of God, but just a tradition. For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, in context, and Mark bears this out as well, it wasn't that these men had unclean hands physically. The idea is that we go back to Mark, he talks about how they did things in a special way. He uses that term in the New King James. And so they weren't doing things their way, right? Don't wash your hand with this towel. Wash your hand with this towel, right? You ever been in someone's bathroom and we say, well, that is the guest towel. You use this towel, right? You had that towel for the special guest that never really ever came, came in, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, verse 3. Why do you, he, look what Christ responds with in verse 3. And he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition?" If that's not a slap in the face with the truth, I don't know what is. Because he just told them, your tradition that you say we're not keeping, it's actually going against the commandments of God, right? Because you're making all these traditions that go against God. Tradition is okay until you're making it bigger and more important and even going against in contradiction to God's word. And so he asked them, why do you also transgress the command of God? Because of your tradition. Now here's what they're doing. For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who cursed his father and mother, let me put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever property you might have received from me as a gift to God, they need not to honor his mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Their traditions were actually separating them from God, wasn't it? Because they were going against the word of God, committing sin. Thus, they're being separated from God by their own tradition. Look at verse 7 as he goes on to say here. He calls them hypocrites, which means they're phonies. The appearance of a holiness without holiness, they're hypocrites. Why? He says, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, or you could say in emptiness, that's what vain means, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
You could say they were teaching as doctrines as if they were uh, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men, right? As if they were actually from God. Taking their commandments and saying their, their tradition saying, this is what you have to do. And putting it out there in such a way it appears it's from God. Thus they what? They are trying to honor God with their lips, but their heart, he says in verse 8, is far from me. And as a result of all these things, he said, their, their worship is in vain. It does sound like God has a narrow point of view of how we are to view his, how we are to treat his word and traditions and worship in general. God's way or it's not going to be correct. The narrow path for correct worship. Colossians 3 verse 16 tells us that the word of Christ will only richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Sing, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, how are we to sing to God? With just our voices. Only our voices. And he says here in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which means we teach one another through our singing. By singing sound songs, when we praise God, we actually teach one another. You've been singing a song and you think, no, I never thought about that, that phrase before. And it encourages us, doesn't it? But the word of Christ will only richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. The word admonishing there is actually the idea of encouraging one another. So we teach and we encourage one another. How? He says through songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, all being a reference to different types of songs that we sing. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. We sing with our heart when we sing to God. You ever notice sometimes if a song leader has to clear his voice, how quiet it gets? But they have to pause, and all of a sudden you don't hear but just a few quiet, still voices. You know, I don't have the best singing voice there ever is, that's for sure. But we should always be those that when we're singing, if a song leader has to take a breath, take a sip of water, that the song continues on vibrantly, right? It doesn't get quiet. But we can hear each other singing because we want to be those who are teaching and admonishing one another. And we can't do that if only our lips are moving when nothing is coming out. Look at John 4 and verse 24. John 4 and verse 24 reminds us how we are to worship God. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth in verse 24 is a reference to our attitude and then how we worship God. That is, in accordance to his word. We have the right attitude when we come to worship God, and we worship him in a way that we find within God's word, right? And not add anything to it. You know, we think about this as we continue on. It wasn't my intention to try to get any, into any of these very, super deeply, and so we're not going to. But I want us to move on looking at the solution to sin is a narrow path. You think about that, the solution to sin, there's only one way to take care of it, isn't it? There's only one solution. You know, if you go to the doctor's office and you have a cold or you have the flu or whatever it may be, they can give you, there are several different medications they may give you, right? Some may give you something for your, for your cough, for your running nose. Some may give you something for your fever, for your aches and pains. And they may prescribe something for this, for, they all may prescribe uh, things for the same symptoms, but they all may prescribe something different, right? Over here, you may get something uh, acetylene. Over here, you may get uh, something acetylene, right? It could be a different medication for the same symptoms. We know in the Bible, the problem is the same and the cure is the same as well. God prescribes the same cure for the problem that has plagued mankind since really the beginning of time, right? The cure has stayed the same. In Luke chapter 13, beginning in verses, verse 1 and going through verse 5, here the Bible says, There were present that season some who had told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? 
He's talking about those who suffered because of their faith, right? And those who suffered because of just ruthlessness and persecution. And he says in verse 2, he says, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Do you think they were worse than everybody else? No. He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish, right? Now they were being, the Galileans here were those who were being, uh, you know, they were being killed obviously by Pilate. He says, had, had Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. Look at verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Do you think they were worse than everybody else? See, a sinner in the eyes of God is a sinner. We have those things which are grotesque, no doubt, sometimes, but sin, no matter what sin it is, will separate man from God. He says in verse 4, Do you think they, they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. They were what? In sin when they, they, they died because of sin. And what happens, we find in verse 5, he says, you're going to perish just like them if you do not repent. Just like them. What do we need to do? We need to repent of our sins, don't we? Either truly repent and be forgiven or perish. You know, there are narrow steps of repentance. Look at Matthew chapter 3, looking at verses 7 and 8. He says, When he saw me, the Pharisees and Sadducees, coming to his baptism, this is John the baptizer, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now they were coming to him really to question him and just give him a hard time in general. And thus when, when uh, John sees them there in verse 7, he welcomes them as brood of vipers, which because we know, as we know verses, in verse 7, it's the Pharisees and Sadducees, they rarely came with a genuine and pure heart and honest intentions, did they? In fact, in Matthew 19, when Christ is talking about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, the whole section begins with they came to him testing him. In verse 7, you think the Pharisees and Sadducees came to John testing him? It doesn't say that, but by, their, by the comments and things that are said, it seems John understood that perfectly. Thus he calls him brood of vipers, that is dangerous people, really. That's how I look at it. He says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. What are fruits worthy of repentance? Fruits are, is a reference to our actions, and those fruits are to be showing what? Acts that are worthy of your repentance. It means you show by your actions that you have repented there in verse 8, right? Therefore, bear fruits. Show your action by your actions. You have what? That you have repented. Bear fruits worthy of repentance, turning from your ways. Look at Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8. Now in Acts chapter 8, you have a man who was formerly known as Simon the Sorcerer. Back in verse 13 of Acts chapter 8, he was actually converted. He was no longer a uh, heathen, we might say. He, he was baptized and he was following along with them as they were preaching and teaching, seeing the things they were doing, and he was astonished. He was a new convert, Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone who, on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. There's the sin right there, isn't it? Now some would say, well, he's a new convert. He's okay. Look at verse, 19, uh, verse 20. But Peter, answered, but Peter said to him, Your money perish with you. I mean, you can die with that money, right? Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness, and pray if God perhaps, and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. He was a new convert who already needed to do what? What we call a second law of pardon, right? Confess, repent, and pray. And we find in verse 22, he says, Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. You'll find in verse 23, he asked Peter to pray for him, doesn't he? Now, you back up for just a moment. There are some today who will tell you that the, the Christian is never told to repent. 
What is Simon in Acts chapter 8? Following verse 13, he's a Christian. He obeyed in verse 13. What's he told to do in verse 22? Repent. Repent, why? Because he wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there are some today I've heard firsthand who will tell you, well, you know, his heart was filled with bitterness. He wasn't, you know, Christians still never told to repent. No, that's actually not true at all. He was told to repent. He had to. We find in verse 23, by those words, he asked Peter to pray for him that none of these things might come upon him. We find he wanted to take care of it, didn't he? Repentance, forgiveness of our sins, is the cure for sin. Obedience to the gospel. The Christian who sins must repent. We find throughout the Bible, the, the non-Christians, they want to have heaven as their home and have their sins remitted. They have to obey the gospel. Acts 2, verse 37 and 38, when they heard the, the sermon of Peter, what did he tell them in verse 37? They asked in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He tells them to repent and be baptized. For the, what purpose? For the remission of their sins, right? We must remember that. So a question for us today. Are you narrow-minded in a spiritual sense? Are we those who have the desire to be locked on and follow the Word of God and only the Word of God? To cast aside traditions, to cast aside ideas of those who may come later in life? You know, it was one of the things I've seen this year, which was very sad, but it was very obvious, was a, a deep following to follow men, even when they were in grave error. You know what happens when you do that? You're no longer following God. You can't follow God and men at the same time, can you? If you follow men, you're teaching false doctrine. If you follow men, you're teaching truth, but you're still following men, you're still in, in, a, in the wrong, aren't you? See, godly men who teach truth will lead you to follow God and not themselves. To lead you to become a fan of God and not of theirs. We are be those who follow God and no one else. Look at Matthew chapter 15. In verse 10. Matthew 15, beginning in verse 10, looking on through verse 12. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. You remember we mentioned this earlier back when we were talking about those who are being accused of, of eating with you know, unwashed hands and those types of things. And we find here in verse 15 in Matthew's account, he says, It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. The disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when, when they heard this saying? The Pharisees were offended. You know offended is an old word? People today like to use that a lot, don't they? I'm offended by what you said. If it's the truth, well, take it up with God. Right? I mean, the Bible's the only thing that's going to save us. The truth is only going to save us. If people are offended, let them be offended by the truth. And when, when they say this in verse 12, do you not know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? I mean, it sounds like they're saying, do you not know you hurt their feelings? Look what Christ says in verse 13. He answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Every false person will be uprooted. Every false way will be uprooted, right? Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. Let that phrase sink in in verse 14. They are blind leaders teaching what? False teaching. They are teaching their own tradition. They even call it the tradition of the elders, right? They are blind leaders. And what are they doing? They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Meaning they're both going to be what? Condemned. If they're not willing to come out of, out of their false ways, they're not willing to turn from their traditions, he says, let them fall into the ditch. He's not saying, he's, the idea here when we look at this text, it's not the idea that God doesn't care about them and Christ doesn't care about them. You have to remember who he's talking to. These men wanted nothing to do with absolutely truth. They wanted nothing to do with Christ. All he tells them to do is to get away from your traditions. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And he tells them to what? 
you're addressing the commandment of God by your tradition, and they say, what? Well, you hurt their feelings, they're offended, and Christ says, well, they're both going to fall into the ditch because they're following traditions of men and not the commandments of God. As we close this, this morning, are you narrow-minded in your faith to God? You know, there's only one way to get to heaven, and we find it within the Bible. Mommy and Daddy can't lead us to heaven. They can show you through the Bible how to get to heaven, but they can't take you by the hand and carry you there. Grandma and Grandpa can't do it either. We have to follow God's Word, don't we? Are we willing to stay the course and follow the commandments of God? Do you remember how the path of the Christian is described? We read it when we first started. Enter by the narrow gate, right? For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That word narrow means what? It means if you want to get through there, you may have to make some adjustments to get through that narrow gate. There's, it's a simple, short, narrow path. He reminds us there in verse 13 that the wide gate, the broad way, it leads to destruction. He says there are many going by. There are many who are on there. There are many who are on that broad path that we may know firsthand. We may know for a long time, but if they're on the broad path, friends, we don't follow them to destruction, do we? No, we get on the narrow path. If we deviate from the narrow path and find ourselves meandering over to that broad, easy path, friend, we better realize that we are on the wrong way. You look at verse 14. Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, I'm reminded of what Christ also tells us in the gospel accounts when he tells us to come unto him, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's quite the statement to say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because what was Christ's yoke and his burden, so to speak? To follow and do God's will upon the earth and to die on the cross for all mankind and rise again. And that was his easy yoke and easy burden. Doesn't sound very easy, does it? Well, why, why do you think, or how do you think we can view our yoke and our burden in our own lives as easy? Maybe when we stop caring about what the world thinks about us, when we stop listening to the media about how they think we should be living and their idea of truthfulness and honesty and on and on. See, things become much easier when we stop allowing ourselves to be judged by others, or maybe we just decided we're going to ignore their judgments. Because not everyone has the right idea. Only God does. The Bible has the only correct path, not mankind. Men say things sometimes that sound good until we open up our Bibles. We say, you know what? That Actually, that's not very good at all. That's a very bad idea. You know, it sounds good to say, oh, you know, we want to love one another. You know, the world wears those little shirts and say, you know, love, you know, whatever, everybody, right? It sounds good. Yeah, we want to be loving and caring towards others. We don't want to condone sin, do we? God loves mankind, John 3, verse 16, but he hates sin. So much so, he will send us to hell if we will not get away from it. That should tell us something, shouldn't it? Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go by it. Is that not a warning? We have a direction, a command, enter by the narrow gate. The warning is what? Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many going by it. There's your warning. Go here. Don't go here. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way, which leads to life, true life, eternal life with God. You can talk about being life as a Christian is on that narrow path. It's not one that I say, it's not a path that's based upon what I think, what I see, or what anyone else thinks or sees. It's based upon what God has laid out for us. That's the narrow path. And people start telling us, well, you should do this, or you should do this, and you should do this. And it's not lining up with God's word. Ignore it. Stay away from it. 
But sometimes, friends, we find ourselves like the disciples back in Matthew when they tell Christ, you know, realize the Pharisees were offended by your saying? It's okay for people to be offended. Do we realize that? It's okay for people to not agree with everything that we do or say. Because the only one we have to agree with on the, at the end of the day is God, isn't it? Right? No one else. So ask yourself this question this morning. Are you narrow-minded in the spiritual sense? Are you on that narrow path that God has laid out for the Christian? And if not, we need to get on it. We obey, we get on that narrow path first by obeying the gospel, don't we? We hear the word of God, we believe, we believe in the word of God, we believe Christ is the word, is the Son of God based upon what we have heard. We repent of our sins based upon what we have heard what we now, and what we now believe. We repent of our sins. We confess because we have heard what we believe and because we are willing to repent. We're also willing to confess that Christ is the Son of God. And based on what we have, on what we have heard and what we believe, and what we, and because we have now repented of our sins, we have, no, we have now confessed Christ as Son of God. Because part of what we believe is now also found in Acts 2, isn't it? And throughout the book of Acts. That we are baptized for the purpose of the remission of our sins. And we're added to the body of Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. And then we are told that we are to, to remain faithful to God. John 14, 15 tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. John, 1 John 2 reminds us that if we do sin, we have advocate with the Father, don't we? We confess those things to God. We repent of our sins to God. We go to him in prayer. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 1 and verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thus we will be on that narrow path. It's not a, I don't know, when it comes to our spiritual life, if knowing we are saved or not, we can know we are saved. 1 John 5 reminds us that we do, how do we know we are His? We do His commands. That's how we know. And that includes God's plan of, of obedience to the gospel and God's plan for those Christians who have sinned and how to correct that problem as well. We can always know. This morning, as you think about these things, we can help you or encourage in any way. You can come forward now. Let's get every sin and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>